Hello everyone and welcome to Quick Med, where medicine is explained quickly and easily. Today we'll be discussing how to diagnose syphilis. This is part two. If you have not yet seen part one, I'd recommend you go and check that out first. The link will be in the video description below. Part one is all about the different stages of syphilis as well as how they present. And before we get started, if you find this video helpful, please make sure to like and subscribe because it really helps out our channel. All right, let's get into it. We'll first cover the serologic tests involved with syphilis and there are two main types. We'll start with the non-treponemal tests and the names are listed in red there. The non-treponemal tests have traditionally been used as the initial screening test for syphilis, mainly because they are affordable and easy to perform. These tests actually detect antibodies to cardiolipin, cholesterol, and lecithin antigen. And because of this, it's actually a non-specific test, and so there can be false positives. We can see false positives mainly in situations like lupus, as well as acute febrile illnesses like endocarditis. There are some other situations, but these are the main ones that are often tested. These tests are also quantitative, and so they are reported as a titer and can often be used to monitor response to therapy. Let's now move on to the second serologic test, the treponemal tests. These tests detect antibodies to specific treponemal antigens, and because of this, they tend to be more specific than the non-treponemal tests. And one thing to know about these tests is that once they are positive, they usually remain positive for life, even when a patient has already received treatment for syphilis, and this is unlike the non-treponemal tests. I'm going to briefly review two non-serologic tests that you may see mentioned. These tests are done on biopsies of active lesions like Schenker's. The spire key is actually too small to be seen using ordinary microscopy, and so on dark field microscopy, you can see the spire key or the spiral-shaped organisms on dark field illumination. Another test is the direct fluorescent antibody, which is where you have these fluorescent antibodies binding to treponemal antigen, giving them this bright green appearance. All right, let's get back to serologic testing because it's the mainstay of diagnostic testing for syphilis. As we mentioned before, the traditional screen involved starting with a non-treponemal test, and if that was positive, moving on to a treponemal test to confirm whether or not the person actually had syphilis. But now that newer versions of the treponemal tests have become easier to use, there is now a reverse screen that can be done where you start with a treponemal test and then move to the non-treponemal test. But regardless of which sequence is used, diagnosing syphilis requires that two different serologic tests be positive. This is because both tests, whether you're talking about the treponemal or the non-treponemal, are not perfect as they both can have false negatives and false positives, making the diagnosis challenging. And because of this, diagnosing syphilis requires not only looking at the lab results, but considering the clinical context, such as the presence or absence of clinical disease, as well as any prior history of syphilis. Interpreting the results of these serologic tests can be confusing, but we will run through cases in order to make this a little bit easier. We're going to go into a lot of detail discussing the interpretation of different test results. If you'd really like just more of a general overview, focus on bullet points number one in each of the cases, but if you'd like to get some more information, then pay attention to the later numbers as well. But just so you know, you're most likely going to be tested on the information that is in bullet points number one. The rest are more for your own understanding and not necessarily for the test questions. All right, let's start with case number one, where you have a patient coming in with either a negative non-treponemal test or a negative treponemal test if you did the reverse screen. This would indicate that the person does not have syphilis, but there's also a caveat to consider. If the patient had a recent unprotected sexual encounter within the last few weeks, it's possible that there is actually syphilis, but it just has not yet been detected on the tests. This is because both tests can take about two to four weeks to seroconvert and give a positive result in the setting of a new infection. If you're ever concerned enough, you can always retest the patient a few weeks later. Okay, case number two. Here we did a traditional screen where we started with a non-treponemal test that was positive, and so it reflexes to your treponemal test, which also turned out to be positive. This can indicate that the person has active infection. It's also possible that the patient was recently treated for syphilis and their titers have not yet decreased. Because remember, as we said, the treponemal test is usually going to remain positive for life, but the non-treponemal test titers will decrease over time. Another possibility is that this patient did have syphilis but did not receive adequate treatment or failed to respond to treatment. And just for your information, successful treatment is defined as a fourfold decrease in titers, such as going from 1 to 32 to 1 to 8. Now let's look at case 3 where we started with the reverse screen. So we had a positive treponemal test and then drew the non-treponemal test and that was negative. This can indicate that the patient had syphilis that was treated, which is why their non-treponemal titers are negative, but their treponemal test is positive because it remains positive for life. But if this patient tells you that they had no history of any syphilis that was treated, then you begin to wonder why the treponemal test was positive in the first place. Because as you mentioned, the treponemal test is more specific than the non-treponemal test, and so you should see false positives a little less often. 
So if the patient has never been treated for syphilis, then what you can do is you can check a second treponemal test, not a non-treponemal test, that targets a different treponemal antigen. If that is positive, you can consider this a positive syphilis test and treat the patient. If the second treponemal test comes back as negative, then you can consider the first initial positive treponemal test as a false positive. This can definitely happen, but it's less common. All right, this is our final case, case four, where we started off with a traditional screen. So here we have a positive non-treponemal test and that reflexes to your treponemal test again, but the treponemal test here is found to be negative. And if you remember, we did mention that the non-treponemal test is non-specific, and so it can be falsely positive. So here, given that we only have a positive non-treponemal test but a negative treponemal test, we can consider this as a false positive non-treponemal test. And this would be the case if a patient says that they had no possible recent exposure to syphilis because, as we mentioned, there can be false negatives when you test really early on in the setting of active infection. But one thing that you'd want to do here if you're sure that this is a false positive result is make sure that you evaluate for reasons why this is a false positive, such as by ruling out other underlying conditions like lupus. I've attached the slide here so that you have all the different non-treponemal and treponemal names listed out, including their abbreviations as well as their full names. I wouldn't recommend trying to memorize all of these different names. I would say learn all of the non-treponemal test names really well, as well as their abbreviations, so that you know anything else is a treponemal test. RPR and VDRL are the most commonly mentioned non-treponemal tests from what I've seen on the exams, but another trick that you can use is to look for TP in the abbreviations because those stand for treponema pallidum and those would be for your treponemal tests only. Alright, so just like in usual fashion, we'll end things off with a practice question. Here we have a 23-year-old woman who comes to the office for a follow-up examination. Two weeks ago, serologic testing for syphilis was positive, but let's see which test they had used initially. A rapid RPR was reactive at 1 to 8, so they use the traditional screen here, and then a fluorescent treponemal antibody absorption, or the FTA-ABS test, was negative, which is your treponemal test. So just to summarize, we have a positive non-treponemal test and then a follow-up negative treponemal test. The physician determines that the patient does not have syphilis. Which of the following is the most likely rationale for sequential screening tests in this patient? Let's first interpret the test results. So here we have a positive non-treponemal test, and then we follow it up with a treponemal test that is negative. This is the same situation that we saw in case number four, and so we can say that this is a false positive non-treponemal test result. But now the question is asking, what is the most likely rationale for sequential screening tests in this patient? This requires knowing a little bit about each of the different tests, and so the answer here would be because of the high sensitivity of RPR and high specificity of the FTA-ABS test. With screening tests, you ideally want to start with a sensitive test which can catch all the false positives and true positives so that you're not missing out on any possible disease. You then follow up with a more specific test to confirm whether or not disease is actually present. Alright everyone, I hope you found this video helpful. It can be difficult to understand syphilis test results, so feel free to review this video again until you understand it fully. As always, good luck studying everyone.